Good evening, Grizzlies. OGs, welcome back to another episode of Grizzly Books True Crime. Here comes my intro for our very special guest tonight. We have a former Scotland Yard homicide detective with more than 30 years of investigative experience, the author of a very cool book that you have to check out, Murder Investigation Team, How Scotland Yard Really Catches Killers, the founder of Murder Academy, the world's first site that brings the truth of how murders are investigated to true crime fans. That's all of us, right? You guys should go check it out. We'll, I'll share it with you in a moment. The links are also in the description box uh, below. And to YouTuber now as well. And thank you to the Grizzlies who already went there to subscribe. I'll share that as well in a moment. Welcome to Stephen Keogh. Hi, Gisela. <laughs> well pronounced as well. Thank you. I did my best there. I'm like, Keo, don't say the GH. <laughs> yeah. Keo, Stephen Keo, welcome. They all say carve it up and welcome. Thank you, everyone. If you have questions, feel free to ask. I'll attend to them uh, when I can. I'm sure the mods will also alert me. Thank you to the mods who are here tonight as well. I really appreciate you. So let's see. What's my first question, right? Firstly, congratulations on your incredible career. I believe you just officially retired a few days ago. How does Two that days. feel? Two, two days. days. Oh, my goodness. Two days retired, everyone. <laughs> yeah. So how, do, how does that feel? Uh, it feels it's exciting, actually. Um, if I'm honest, so I, 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 if you'd asked me four or five years ago, how would I feel right now? I'd probably think a little bit nervous because I, I joined the police when I was 20. Um, so my whole adult life, I've been a police officer. I can't remember. I can almost not remember being a police officer. So I'd have thought, like, how would I feel now? But because of what I'm doing, the book, the the business, the, the every, everything else goes with it, I'm excited. Um, yes. So yeah, so I, I feel like I'm in a good place. I feel like I've done. I think I've done that. I've done my bit yeah. in the police, and now I'm really excited for what comes You've next. You've done what we all want to do over here. <laughs> do right, it. true crime, right? Do it, everyone. Let me show job. you the slide quickly. Hold on, let's put it in. <laughs> Is it this mode? Wait, this mode. Which one? That's my I? children. I just... So. So that's my son and my daughter, and they're both in the police. Um, oh my goodness! Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they 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 followed me in. Um, so yeah, I'm really proud of them. I'm really 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 proud of them. It looks great, and for no one, if you can't see it, it says this is to certify that Detective Inspector Stephen Keogh joined the police service as constable on the 28th of October 1991 and retired on the 31st of October 2021. The officer's conduct was exemplary. Wow. Amazing. Thank you. And yeah, that was see... taken last week. We had a ceremony at Scotland Yard and um, we're only allowed one guest, but I managed to sneak, because well. uh, my children are both <laughs> in the police, I managed to sneak them in and they were fine with ah, that. VIP um, access. Yeah, really, really, really <laughs> proud to share it with them. I'm aware that's so interesting that they're both also in the police. That is amazing. Sometimes, you yeah. know, if you're in, if, if your dad is in police, you're like, oh, I don't know. My dad was actually also a police officer and I love true crime and wish I could have been one. <laughs> so it actually makes sense. And so, so amazing that your children are also, they say very good looking children. <laughs> Thank you so yeah, much, everyone. I'm I do question whether I'm their dad or not. I think I might have to take some paternity tests. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> New true crime investigation <laughs> on yeah. retirement. Congrats on retirement, retirement, Mr. Keo, they say. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you, Keo. I appreciate that. Yes, and they're all saying, welcome, welcome. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So the first question that I think, right, that many of us have, what is Scotland Yard? Why is it not in Scotland? And how does it differ from the FBI or the NYPD? Okay, so um, so Scotland Yard essentially is the headquarters of Metropolitan Police. And it has been for um, a couple of hundred years now. And it was it there was a building, probably three or four buildings ago, and there was an entrance to it, which was on a road called um, New, uh, New Scotland Yard, I think. It called, no, Scotland Yard was the road. Um, and it was the public entrance. So people just started to call it Scotland Yard. So and it's all, it all to do with the road it was on. It's got nothing to do with Scotland. <laughs> um, right. And since then, as it's moved, it's become known as New Scotland Yard. New, I think now we're in... It's not called this, but it should be new, new, new Scotland Yard. It's like the I say we. I'm not. It's me anymore. It, they are in the, that's the new building now. So it should be new, new, new Scotland Yard. Okay, I was going to see if I could find a picture of it for everyone to see. New Scotland Yard, I believe. I don't know. I read something about it, and they're like, "Oh my word! The the outside is kind of powered electrically now. It's like all lit up." New Scotland Yard. Are you are you, are you in front of uh, uh, London? There is that the Millennium World. Me, yeah, right. me. Right. So the background here. Yep. London yeah. Eye. So if you were to turn to your right now, you'd see Scotland Yard. So where that picture was, you could see the London Eye in the background. 
So Scotland Yard is literally smack bang opposite the, uh, the wheel. The other way. That <laughs> oh, way. Other way? This you, way? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> That, so you're turn, actually you're finger now you're touching Scotland Yard. Ah, okay, okay, it's, it's okay. Just, uh, I'm touching it, everyone. New Scotland Yard. Go check it out. I checked out some documentaries on you know Scotland Yard versus New Scotland Yard. It's actually very interesting to figure out the history of that. Uh, thank you and welcome, everyone. Thank you for all your kind comments as well. I'm always appreciative of you kind to the guests. That's so nice. They say I subscribe to Murder Academy and watch the video. I'll be back to that channel. <laughs> Thank you. And right. there'll be more videos. I know there's only one at the moment, but I've only been there for two days. So uh, uh, there'll yeah, definitely be some more. Can't wait to learn more, right? So let's see. what. Uh, yeah. So what is the difference between yeah, Scotland Yard and New Scotland Yard? That was my question, which I think you answered. It's literally just, is it the same location? Just new name? No, no. It's moved. It's not far. Oh, moved. Okay. It's all, okay, they're okay. all within like a mile of each other, but they're just, they've just moved different buildings. And the okay. one they're in now, I think they've been there for about four or five years. Did you work in the new Scotland Yard too, right? Because you just retired no, two days ago. Not? Okay. No. So, so um, I did, when I was on the anti-terrorist branch, I worked at Scotland Yard, the, the one before. Um, but now it's literally the headquarters, so it's senior officers. Um, I, I, I'm not aware of any detectives that work from there now. It's, it's so although they call us okay. Scotland Yard detectives, nobody actually works at Scotland Yard anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> come on don't crush our dreams yeah, Scotland Yard. right <laughs> and sorry there's okay. another question about how it differs from the fbi yes yes how does it differ from the fbi yeah so um so essentially it, it's the police for london but they hold uh national responsibilities so um so for terrorism and particular crimes that it will be investigated by scotland yard um yes. even though it's not a london crime so we got we get I keep saying we, it's not we anymore, is it? They get extra funding um, for national um, responsibility. And also they'll go out na internationally as well. So um, particularly in Commonwealth countries, so, so um, countries that years ago would have been ruled by Britain, um, if there's a particular crime happens there, they may call Scotland Yard and say, look, we've, we've got some difficulties. There's a particular uh, difficult crime okay. to investigate and we'll send people out to, to assist with those investigations. And what was your uniform like? <laughs> I know that's a weird question, but did you have that like hard hat? You know, I've seen, I've just <laughs> seen pictures of it. Yeah, so dress? I joined in 91 <laughs> um, and I, I think 95 was the last time I wore a uniform. And so when you're out and about, and so you're answering calls, you're in a car, you're answering calls, they wear a flat hat. Um, when they're on foot and they're walking around or they're doing ceremonial um, duties, they'll wear the, the hard hat, like the helmet. Ah, oh, okay, okay. All right, so I'm just seeing wonderful guests. So fun. They say, welcome, Detective Keo. Ex when you were an uh, ex-retired -detect detective, right? Yeah. Two days. I'm not, I'm not even <laughs> retired because it makes me feel like old and like I'm not doing anything. I'm probably busier now than I've ever been, so... I prefer so, former or ex, not retailers. That's how it goes, right? I've seen, uh, even with Police Off the Cuff, it's NYPD detective. They're busier now than before. Like, when, when you retire, <laughs> well, I think it's from the intensity of the work you do, right? In in homicide investigations, you can't just stop, like, what, kick kick up your feet and just, what, drink yeah. a lemonade and <laughs> chill out? It's not going to work like that, right? <laughs> and I'm, only, I'm 50. I know that may sound old to, to some, some people, but for uh, Doubtful. me, I feel, I feel too, I couldn't just give up. Right? No way. Them. No way. Yeah. You're only a third of the way there. <laughs> right? Yeah. So much still to do. Um, okay. So let me see. When you were a young boy, did you dream of one day becoming a detective? No. Funnily enough, even when I joined the police, I, 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 I wanted to be a dog handler when I first joined the police. Wow. Okay. Um, and I have one of those, the canines as they call them. Um, but I just kind of got drawn. So what I, what I re really early on, what I realized that I really enjoyed was uh, catching criminals and um if you're going to catch criminals the way you do it is become a detective so i kind of i kind of sort of gravitated towards that um and then as, as the longer i was in the the more serious the cause i suppose it's a bit i'm a bit if you're someone who uses drugs and they're on soft drugs and they go to hard drugs i was on soft criminals and i wanted to get more and more and more <laughs> and then i found murder and i just found my my niche and i stayed there for 12 years and i that I, I cannot even put into words the the satisfaction you get from you put so much you put your heart and soul into um, trying to catch a killer yes. and you sat there in court and the the jury 
I can't even, I can't even, the, the adrenaline, even just now thinking about it, you spend, you spend months and months and months, possibly years investigating a crime. You invest yourself completely. You become a part, not part of the family, but you really, you're, you, yes. you sort of share in their grief. And then you can be weeks, even months at court. And it's really hard. And it's really, the defense put up a, obviously a, a big fire and it can get dirty. And you get to that point where you're sat there um, and the jury walk in. And you I, you could literally cut the atmosphere in the court with a knife. You got you got judges that have been there for years, barristers that have been there for years, the the court staff, and everybody is just like we've, wow. we've, we've come to this point. And you sat there, and they and they and they uh, they asked the jury foreman to stand up and say, "Have you come to a decision that you all agree?" And when they say yes, and you're like, and you're waiting for that, and when you get that guilty, um, oh. uh, honestly, you can't you can't put it into words. <laughs> Um, oh and also the, the, the first people I always looked at were the family, um, because you, you, you're there for them. As, much, yes. as satisfying as it is, you know, it's obviously professionally, to catch a killer, to convict them is is, your, is what your job is. Um, but when you've shared in the grief of that family, and the first thing you do is you look at them, and you can see just the relief, and it's like I like, and, and uh, so many times they would say to me afterwards um, that they can they feel like they can move on now. And oh, to yeah. feel that you've you've had a part to play in that, that they've they've like you kind of begin to. I I can't imagine what it's like to. I've I've, I've lost my dad, but it wasn't through murder. If I'd lost him through yeah. murder, I can't even begin to imagine what that would be like. Um. So you, you, but to feel that you can help them then move on and start to repair their life is just it's just a fantastic feeling. Um. And once I got that once, I knew that I was never going to do anything again within the police and oh, I, yeah. I never left and um when I got promoted I stayed and yeah it's just a fantastic job wow that sounds actually really fulfilling and so it must be such a relief when you do see that as in guilty guilty and they what they get handcuffed right and walked right off goodbye <laughs> no not really no, not really no it's not as dramatic as that but um, <laughs> come on <laughs> yeah no. goodbye uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so but obviously the, I, I say the first so the first people to look at the, the um as a family and then quickly I'll look over at the defendant um just to see how they react um obviously because it's, it's impactful now I, 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 it's, it's just such a good job I loved right. it wow that is amazing so you worked over 100 I believe homicide cases in your career um, yeah I mean I was there for them... 12 years and um yeah you deal with a lot of cases so right there's a lot of cases there's there's some that I just saw around around over 100 so are there any that you want to highlight or talk about or weigh in that you had expertise on we'd love to hear about your experience I, I, I wouldn't say I've got an ex because all murders are different, but they're all the same in a, in a, in a weird way. So every, every single murder has got its own unique um, characteristics, but they're all investigated roughly the same way. You're looking for the same answers. So there's certain questions that you need to answer. Who, who did it? Where, where did it happen? When did it happen? How did it happen? Why did it happen? So that yes. you have the same questions in each murder. So, there's a bit of a mystique around how murders are investigated, but they're actually really quite simple because you, you, you've you got those questions. So if you've got those questions in your mind, yes, it, the trick is to find out, to know how to answer those questions. That's what you learn as a detective. So, but if you think of it that simply, so where did it happen? So you, you put your resources into where, often it's obvious, sometimes it's not. How did it happen? post-mortems, uh, witnesses, CCTV. Um, when did it happen? Again, witnesses. CCTV. So the, 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 if you've got those questions and you know what you're looking to answer, it, it makes it very, very simple. And once you've built up the, the, the picture that you need to pick, build up, um, that, that's when you get your charge, that's when you get conviction. So um, it's just, it's just, it's lit. It, 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 I think there's a lot more mystique around investigating murders than it actually is. Maybe because I've been done, doing it for so such a long time that I do see it as that simple and, and, and that plain. Yes. Um, but it, it, the, the trick is knowing what questions to ask and knowing how to find the answers to those questions. And once you do that, so that so that's where my expertise lies. Um, in terms of cases I've dealt with, so everything. I mean, you... you, 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 you there are so many ways in, what, in which people die and, I, die. and over the 12 years, obviously, I dealt with all of those. And when I was on the anti-terrorist branch, obviously, I dealt with different different ones that, that way. Um, so I, if 
if there's specific cases that stick in my mind, it was always children. I always found those the hardest to deal with. Now, whether it's because I'm a father or not, um, but seeing children murdered was always mm. hard for me. And I and I'm not. It's difficult, and you, and you go to the post mortems, and you're seeing like a baby that's it's a baby. Wow. And yeah. That's really yeah, that. Though, if if ever I was to look back at my career and think what is going to stick with you, what are mm. those sights that when you close your eyes and you can see it? It's the children. It's always for me. It was always the children. Yes. Yeah. I think a lot of the audience also resonate with that. They also they always say that. So that kind of answers this. What case haunts you still? So it'd be those those cases, I would assume. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say any case haunts me, as in. Um, so, if, so if, if if you think about a path, so I, I, I always look, uh, try and explain it this way. So um, nobody ever becomes a Scotland Yard detective straight away. You have to, yes. you have to get the path you have to follow. So you start off, you start off in uniform, and when you're in uniform, you're dealing with calls to accidents, so people were dying in car crashes, um, people dying in the street, people dying in their houses, um, all, all, all sorts of situations. So, you, like for me, I was like, I was a kid. I was like 18 months out of school. I'd never seen a dead body, and I got introduced to it quite quickly. And you kind of, you kind of build yourself up slowly, and it's almost like a filter. So. If you can deal with that, if you can handle dead people, uh, blood, blood, gore, and all that sort of stuff, if you can handle that, then you think you then you sort of become a detective. Then once you become a detective, you see more of it. You get called to so if there's a, a, a body and it could be a murder, might not be a murder, they'll call a detective down and they have to go into the scene and, and try and establish whether it's a murder or not. Mm -hmm. So you're exposed to more, and you go to you go to post. I call them post mortems, but your your audience, if they're from America, they're known as autopsies. So you yes. so you go into those. So each time as you go along, it's like a filter. So if if you can't handle that as a as a uniform officer, you're not going to become a detective. So then you become a detective, and you're exposed to it more, and then you decide if you're going to become a homicide detective. You know what you're going into, so you're almost taking that next step. With, with open eyes you know you're going to go into scenes you're going to you're going to you're going to see a lot of grief mm. um, and when I say grief grief sometimes the hardest thing for me to deal with wasn't ever going in and seeing a dead body because once you've seen one dead body two three talk that it, it, it you become a little bit numb to it that's why I say children because I never yes. numb to children but you kind of come a little bit numb to, to to death but what I never become numb to was the grief of the families um, that was always raw. So, you, and and I'm glad it was because if I if I ever reached a point where I could go in and there was a family that were just in, I mean, you can imagine they've just lost their son, their daughter, their husband, wife, whatever it is, and they and they're at the lowest point of their life and they're absolutely distraught. And you're coming in, and it's really difficult because they're, 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 you're trying to balance what you need from them and their needs because yes. you, you you need question you need to answer question they need to answer questions so someone's son's just been killed we'll go in and we, we need to know his life um there's expression um in, in murder investigations um uh, know someone's life to know how they died so you, you have to understand how they lived and the, and generally where you get that from is from the families but you're going in at a point where you, you could have it could have actually just been you you've just told them that their son's died mm -hmm. at the same time you're trying to get out of them who are his friends? What car does he drive? What phone number has he got? Um, is he involved in any crime? Does he use drugs? All this stuff, you're trying to get out of them at the same time as they're trying to process that they've just lost their son. Oh, yeah. Um, and that was really hard. And and, and I'm, I think, if looking back at my career, I can, I can, I, I can, I can reconcile the fact that I can deal with dead bodies and I, and I can, I can deal with blood. If I was numb to those, those people's um, grief, then, I, then I'd be worried because then you, you, there's something wrong there, and I wouldn't be doing it for the right reasons. And that, and and when you're in that, and and you sit there with them, and, and it's the, it's raw, and they've just they've just found out their son's died. That really, really, really motivates you. I, I mean, I've, I said it once. I said it, and I didn't mean to. And I actually said it once. <laughs> and I said I'm going to catch them. And you can't do that because um, you can't promise because you, you don't know you will. Um, yes. I said it once, and I caught myself. <laughs> I was like, and we did thankfully, but. Um, and you tell yourself, I'm going to catch them. Wherever it is, I'm going to catch them because I've seen this grief and, and they need to answer for it. 
And that was a real, that's that, that really motivates you, really, really does. Yes. Goodness. So uh, this question was already answered. Paul, go back five minutes. Uh, Scotland Yard, is it equivalent to our FBI? I guess no. that is a sort of new one. It's not equivalent. It's not, no, right? because F the FBI, right. So I, I'm, I, I'm not an expert on this. And my understanding is they deal with federal crimes. Um, and you have local police deal with, with other crimes. In the UK, there is no there is no distinction between federal crimes. There's just crimes. Yes. Um, and there, there's particular areas. So we, 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 we police London, and we have a national responsibility for certain crimes, but yes. other areas where they have their own police force. You have what's called the National Crime Agency. Um, they're kind of like the FBI in that they've got a national responsibility, um, but they just deal with particular crimes. So they might deal with uh, high level drug dealing, um, uh, organized uh, pedophile rings, that sort of thing. Um, but okay. So, so what, where it crosses borders and it's harder to um, investigate. So if I'm in London and there's a crime that's in uh, the north of England, it's more difficult for me to investigate both. So they will investigate it, if you know what I mean. Yes, um, yes. But we, but, the, but we don't have the real equivalent of the FBI. Okay. One of the one of the questions was, have you ever come across a really evil person? And I can truly imagine in your career you did. <laughs> yeah. The, the one that... The one that always stands out to me, um, if if you read my book, it, there's an opening there's an opening chapter, and it and it talks about a call I went to, and it's one of the it's, it, it it wasn't necessarily. I, I know when people when, when when we talk about murder, the ones that grab the headlines um, are generally the ones that involve I don't know a woman being kidnapped and or there's there's some there's something to it. This this one sort of stayed with me because um, for various reasons. What, I really got to know the family. Yes. Um, really lovely people. Um, and it was a, a woman just going to work one morning. And um, she, she'd been on holiday and she decided that rather than get the uh, bus as she normally did, she'd get the train. Mm -hmm. And she happened to meet this, this, this woman who um, attacked her in the street and um, re really, really serious injuries. And th this woman that attacked her, I would say probably the most evil person I've ever met. Um, she, well, so she'd killed her mum previously. Um, and she, it was almost exactly the same sort of attack. It was, it was of the neck, almost, almost severing, severing head. And she, in the UK, if if you have a mental illness, so you know you've got murder and manslaughter, if it can be proven that your mental illness had a real effect on on the reason why you did it, there's a good chance you'd be found guilty of manslaughter rather than murder, which is what happened to this woman. And mm -hmm. the, the the idea was the, the the reason behind it was that she was um, uh, schizo schizophrenic, so oh, wow. she went into uh, prison. Actually, she went into hospital because she had a hospital order and she came out within, within about two years. And all she had to do was persuade the doctors she was fine. And that's essentially what she did. Um, and then there was this, she, she, there was this, she wanted to, she wanted to go back into um, a hospital. So she went into uh, a mini cab, uh, like a taxi office mm -hmm. and said, um, I want to go, I want to go to hospital. I'm having, I'm having uh, some sort of breakdown. And, and she wasn't, she, she just wanted a lift to the hospital essentially. So wow. the police took her to the local hospital, and um, she once she was there, she said, "I don't want to be at this hospital. I want to be at the other hospital." And they said, "Well, you're here now. This is this is a fine. It's got a mental um, health unit. I don't want to be here." And she ended up storming out. And so she said, "Watch what I'm going to do." And so she essentially she went um, she went into a supermarket and bought a, a, a knife. Um, come right outside, and there's a woman at a bus stop. And she just went to attack her with this knife. And this woman was rolling a cigarette. And she, as she looked up, the, the, the knife was coming down. And she sort of grabbed it and fell out, fell out of her hand. Wow. Stood up. And it was a bit of, bit of a surreal moment. And um, this, this woman was saying, uh, what, what are you doing, you nutter? And uh, in the UK, nutter is uh, like... Yeah. <laughs> And she said, I'm not my nutter. You're the one with the knife. You're the nutter. And she's like, it was like a real surreal moment. So she ran across the road, went into a butcher's shop and got the 
biggest knife she could find, came outside and just stabbed the first person she could see and got arrested there and then. And the whole the whole thing about her case was, I've got, I've got mental illness. I, you can't do anything about to, about me to it. And um, wow. so we got a really good psychiatrist to, to, to look at her. And she wasn't, she, she had a personality disorder. So she was narcissistic. She, she yeah. had no mental illness. Um, and then, <laughs> well, then we were hearing the stuff that when she was in um, a hospital afterwards, she was manipulating staff, manipulate. And, and I've no doubt at all, if this woman was ever released again, she would go and kill. Now to me, now that I've met lots and lots of evil people, but a lot of them seem to be in a position because they are, they're in gangs and, and, and it's almost mm -hmm. like their environment has, has caused them to become the person they've become. She was just pure evil. There was no, there was no reason why she had to, when you went, then we, then we look back at her mum's case, there was no mental illness there. She decided she was going to kill her mum because she'd, her, it was something, she had some argument with her mum. So she killed her mum and nearly cut her head off. And then she did it again. And, and to me that, she is the most evil person I've ever come across because there was no remorse. When I turned up at the scene and she was there, I looked at her and I was like, to, to me, this woman hadn't just killed someone. Um, wow. And I'm in no doubt whatsoever and spent time with her and seen after her, she, she ever got released again, she would, she would not hesitate in killing. Um, mm. So she's the most evil person I've, I've, I've ever come across. And because she's just pure evil, she would just kill for because she couldn't get her own way. Wow, that is unbelievable! My goodness, that no, was we unbelievable. Death penalty. No we death don't have the death penalty. Um, so we did have the death penalty, um, and it stopped in the 1960s. Um, and in re return for that, we have a life imprisonment, which isn't really life imprisonment, but yeah, we don't have the death penalty. Okay, if you see grizzled hat, it's an emoji that doesn't show correctly on Streamyard, but they say, "Is there an unsolved case that still bugs you?" Yeah, and and and. Again, this this is one that's per, because it becomes personal. When for me, where it becomes personal is I'm, I'm not going to cover it up. It's the families. If I, if I'm really connected to the victim's family, it becomes personal for me. And mm. there was there was a young boy. He was um, in in London. We've got a real problem with gangs, and I'm sure most every major city has. Um, and so what 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 this gang was doing? They wanted to go and buy a gun. And what they would do is, rather than risk um, getting caught with the gun coming back, they would drag in poor young, like, not say like, a young kid, and, and this this boy was sixteen, never been in trouble with the police before, and and they thought I don't know whether they threatened him or promised him money, whatever it was, they took him along to buy this gun. What they didn't know was that they were being surveyed by the police. They had intelligence and they stopped them. And they just after just after the the gun was bought, both sides got swapped, 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 um, got arrested. Because he was only six, everyone else went to prison. Because he was only sixteen, mm -hmm. um, he he got released on bail whilst they were all on remand in prison. And they plotted this um, case. They plotted this this um, plan. What they were going to do, they're going to put the blame on this young boy, kill him, and then everybody blame him. And they did. They lured him into a car and they shot him in the back of the head, set the car on fire. Um, in, in the most, I mean, it was just a hit. It was the most callous thing to do. They were never going to get away with this. The, the evidence against them with the gun was overwhelming. It was all on video. It, it, it was overwhelming. Um, and I know, I know, who, I know who did it. And he was on mm -hmm. trial. And so when I say, uns so I know you've said unsolved, but for me, this is because the reason it's unsolved is because I know the, who the killer is and he's walking free today. Oh, wow. Off the court. And um, it was really, really, it was really, really hard. The person that organized it from prison went, went to, got convicted and got 37 years in prison. Um, but I know who the killer was and he's walking free today. Um, and a jury found him not guilty. And that's, to me, that's the one that sticks with me. And if I was to have my time over again and think, could I have done something differently on a case? It would be that. And his family were just lovely. Um, so wow. his, the, the trial was in July and in December. His dad didn't have anything, no money. Got a train to where I worked. It, that would have cost him the money he didn't have. And turned up at Christmas for a Christmas present for me. Um, and I just felt like, wow. oh, I, I just felt like, you're making it worse now.
<laughs> right. I, know, oh. I, really, I really, I know, I really, really want to get the man that killed your son. Um, I know he is, and that was yeah. So that that it's those sort of things that that, that stick with me more because because you get invested in the family. Um, yes. that, that's what that's what stays with me the most. And you just want to do you just you just want to give them the justice they deserve. If that was my son, I'd want the person that killed him in prison. Um, and that's that's so I just put myself in their position, and I couldn't do that for him. Um, no. And that's, that that will always stay with me. That one. Well, wow, right. Uh, was Stephen Keogh involved in solving the Jimmy Seville case? I hope I said it right. And how much does he think Scotland Yard knows before he died? I, I don't know anything about the Jimmy Seville case. There was a, there was a unit that dealt with that within the Metro Police, but I wasn't on it. Um, that okay. wasn't a murder unit. That was um, a sexual offences unit. So I don't really know anything about that case. Okay. Sorry, what did they say? Thank you for sharing that. This aggravating. And they said, what is considered a life sentence in Britain? A life sentence is a life sentence. Um, so another case I dealt with was um, it, it became quite high profile. We've got a, a long running um, soap opera in, in, in the UK called EastEnders. And there was an actress from, from that program that was um, murdered by her husband and two children. And I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of the injuries, but they were some of the most horrific injuries I've seen. And he did this to his to his two young children and um, his wife. So what was what, what, what was the original question? So I'm, I, I want to, I'm conscious I asked that. What was the, where did uh, this... life sentence? Like what is the life sentence? sentence? Sorry, yeah, in... yeah. So so he 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 killed his he killed his um, wife and two children. Um, and then buried them in the garden. Um, police came round. The the uh, her sister reporter was missing. Police come round and said, "Oh, we're worried about your your wife and your children." And he said, "Oh, they've 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 gone away. Um, they've gone they've gone to stay with someone." And in the mean, so as soon as the police left, he then got on a plane to uh, Ghana. Um, and that was a real so it was my responsibility to find him and get him back um and that was really really hard and because it was so high profile um the bbc in in, in the uk what the main news channel sent a reporter out to ghana and they don't have the same restrictions as we have so there was every time i turned on the news this re so i was getting feedback from we, we put out on social media and i was getting phone calls from people in in ghana that were witnessing him and it was almost this race between me trying to steer the ghanaian police and this this mm -hmm. <laughs> british reporter who seemed to be getting closer and closer and um that the, the newspapers decided early on that as was a i think they called it a botched murder investigation and it, it couldn't have been further than the truth um, what possibly was botched was the um, missing person inquiry before, but even when the, by the police, by the time the police got involved, the family were already dead, so nothing could have changed that. Um, so it was real. It was like real pressure because um, if the, the worst thing that could have happened was a, the BBC reporter turning up where he was, sticking a camera under uh, a, a microphone under his nose and start questioning him. Um, but thankfully, managed the guy named police was. <laughs> they were hard to get going but once wow. i got them going they managed to get hold of him um and he got life imprisonment so he will never ever be released and uh, currently within the uk there's about 72 prisoners that will never be released they are um uh generally so there's 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 a few reasons why someone would get a life sentence so the one would be if they've committed murder get released and they could do they commit another murder they would do that Quite often it's to do with children, um, obviously serial killers, um, and then you get some some high profile ones that 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 end up with life imprisonment. But that's 72. So not not a lot, but it does happen. Okay. And then I want to get to this question about your murder academy and your book and everything there. So let's see. <laughs> so in your video why do people kill you taught us three reasons that people kill or the three motives that drive people to commit murder yeah could you expand on the push and pull of emotion and perhaps offer your insight into what you believe was at play i know you haven't looked at this case deeply that we all everyone here is looking at the gabby petito case so that's a possible speculatively domestic violence case that ended in homicide yeah. 
But there's yeah. definitely, when I watched your video, I'm like, ah, that push and pull, those factors seem to be at play. So maybe you yeah. could just tell us a little be. bit about what you know about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there are three reasons people kill. So, and, and they relate to human behavior. So what, 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 I, what I strongly believe is that we overcomplicate why people kill. Because, we, because, we, because it's murder, we seem to think there would be different reasons to motivate someone to do something, but it's not. So murder, murder is an action someone chooses to do. Um, it's illegal, and there are horrible ramifications from it, but it's still an action someone chooses to do. And as human beings, we're, we're motivated by three things. If, you, any, if anybody, if you choose any, if you, you think of um, exercise, um, giving to charity, um, and anything you choose to do, you're going to be motivated by one of three things. You're going to be motivated by how you feel, how you want to feel, or the benefit you're going to gain from it. Um, so when it comes to murder, that, that, they're, they're the three categories that, that I've placed on it that f for motivation. So the first is push of emotion. So that is where a person kills as a result of a triggered emotion. So when we talk about jealousy, revenge, anger, um, uh, th 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 they, they are emotions that have been triggered by an event. And as a result of that triggered emotion, they then go and choose to, to hurt that person. Now, don't, they might not always mean to kill, um, but you don't, I, I, I mean, I don't know the law in, in, in the United States when it comes to murder, but certainly in the UK, mm -hmm. you don't have to intend to kill someone to, to be guilty of murder. All you have to be, be um, in, your intention is either to kill or to cause really serious harm. And as a result of that triggered emotion, the emotion is so intense that it makes somebody want to hurt someone. So when, so I've, I've seen lots of theories on why people kill and they talk about revenge and they talk about lust and they talk about um, anger and they talk about jealousy. And well, if, 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 you, if you think about the words you use, if you start a sentence with, it's because they felt, that is that is push of emotion. They felt angry. They felt they felt that they felt uh, dishonoured. They felt disrespectful. Uh, they felt wh whatever. It that is push of emotion. So that that so all of those emotions can just be summed up by that. Then you have uh, pull of emotion, which is the what I want to feel. So that so these are things like quite often the, the ones that. Um, serial killers might get associated with because they feel that need to um wh whatever whatever thrill they get from killing someone be it enjoyment um sexual gratification um wh wh whatever it is it's th that's what's drawing them to kill mm -hmm. now you mentioned um uh this this case may be domestic violence yes now i'm strongly of the opinion that the majority of domestic violence cases stem from a pull of emotion and that is to do with control and power mm -hmm. now quite often um in my experience people that are particularly men that are involved in domestic violence i find generally a little bit there's something pathetic about them there's something mm -hmm. that they're trying to cover up in themselves to make themselves feel better and they do that by p putting their control and power on their partner but what happens is that goes too far and ends far too often ends up in someone's death. But what, 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 what always happens, what you tend to see is it gets put down to one event. He was angry. He was, she, he, he found out she was seeing someone. He, and what we, what we do is we try, we try and almost, we, we try and make it a bit neater. I'll, I'll, yeah, it happened because because of because of this explosion of emotion. When in fact, what it is, it's a build up. It's power. It's control. And eventually, what happens is it it goes too far, and someone's died. So, it's, it's, this is just my opinion. But my mm -hmm. opinion is that the majority of domestic murders are that. It's 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 that pathetic yes. man trying to make himself feel better i know it's not always men it can be women but it's, it's that person trying to make themselves feel better it's bullying mm -hmm. um, that's what bullies do bully bullies make themselves feel better about you fit back by you feeling worse and to take that to the full extent that it's hurting you and then it's really hurting you and then it's killing you so that's that's the, that's the pull of emotion and then the final one is gain so this is where 
I'm, I, I want something and I'm going to hurt you to get it. The obvious one is robbery. You've, you've got something I want. I want your phone. I want your money. I want your drugs. I'm going to hurt mm -hmm. you. And I, I'm prepared to hurt you in order to get what I want because me getting what I want is more important. Um, and But it goes beyond that. So you've got your robbery. You've got... Um, you can have hitmen. You can have people that are getting financial gain for hurting someone. But gain doesn't have to be a physical possession. It can be. So I, I spoke earlier about gangs and um, gangs quite often, they, they do kill because of emotion, but quite often a lot of what they do, a lot of their killing is because of a bigger gain. It's gain for the, the drugs territories, the the profit they can make from the, from their from their criminal activity, the respect that their gang's going to get. So a lot of gang killing is to do with um, gaining whatever benefit it is. Um, terrorism as well. Dealt with a lot of terrorism. Um, they're killing because they want something, and in the case of a terrorist, they want to further their cause. So I'm going to hurt you. And, quite, and when a terrorist kills. It's not personal. There's no emotion. They might be emotional, but they're not killing because of emotion. They're killing because um, they want something. And the gain doesn't have to be for them. It can be for them or others. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so that, that's the third one. So if you equate that to, to real life, is, which is what I do in my video, when you think about when you go to exercise and the reasons why you go to exercise, if you're talking about, I feel fat, I feel unattractive I, I feel motivated by watching someone else do something that you, that's what's driving you to uh, carry out exercises because of what you feel or when you go running you like the release of endorphins it makes you feel good afterwards whatever that's you're doing it because of how you want to feel or mm -hmm. if you want to lose weight I want to live longer or I want to I want a beach body I, I, I want to sleep better you're doing it because of what you're going to gain so the reason I, what I, I believe we overcomplicate murder, we, we attach something to it because it's because it's it's wrong because it's illegal, but it's still somebody's choosing to do it. And when you choose to do something, you're choosing to do it because of how you feel, how you want to feel, or the benefit you're going to gain from it. And that goes for giving to charity, giving, doing exercise, and murder. Um, and that's mm -hmm. that's why I believe it's simpler than we make out and 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 um so when i when i started writing my book um it was really important to me to understand what true crime fans wanted because i'm, I'm not a true crime fan um so what's the point of me writing to an audience i don't know so i went to a couple of uh, facebook groups uh, one in the uk one in the, one in the united states and got a huge response like 650 responses overwhelmingly the question that people wanted to know is why people kill Yes. Um, so I know it's important, and this is my this is my this is my spin on it. Now, other my, other people might come and go, "Well, you're talking a load of rubbish." But I'm basing that on that the the dozens and dozens of murders I've investigated, knowing human nature as I do, um, and 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 that's that's where that's where I've landed. That's where that's that's what I strongly believe. I'm going to show them your channel in a moment, but I did learn a new word today from <laughs> one of my mods, Occam's Razor. That's kind of what you're explaining, right? Is that what it's called? It's like just, it's simpler than people think. Yeah, 100%. Right, yeah, 100%. right. Yeah. So let me show you uh, Grizzlies. This is the YouTube channel. Okay, Murder Academy. I typed in Jerry Williams here. Yes, so let's type that. Murder Academy. If you look at the videos, here is the video. Why do Sorry. people kill? Surely that. Right, hold on. Let's just start it like this. There we go. So you can go find out all the reasons over there. If you subscribe over there, I would appreciate it. If you Grizzlies went and showed some support over there, Murder Academy. The link is in the description box below. And that would be great because we definitely want to see some more videos over there and learn a lot more from you. You have tremendous insight. I mean, everyone here, I can't even keep up with all the chat. They're just loving it. They're saying fascinating, great show and information, great guests, fascinating. They are loving it. So what I would say is that if you do go over, like the people that have come over, I'll, definitely, I'll engage with you. And what I'm really interested in is to know what you want to know about. Um, yes. I will put out, I will put out content. I'm, I'm planning on putting out a lot of content, but I only want to put out what people want to hear. Um, yes. So whatever question you've got, stick them in, and I'll, and, I, and I'll do my best. And if I can do a video on it, I'll do a video on it. 
Yeah, let's. Um, I think when you get to a thousand subscribers, you can then run those polls on your community tab, which is a really great way to figure out what exactly do people right. want to know from you this week. So let's let, let's do that, Grizzly. Yeah, go, that go carve good. it up over there. That would be amazing. Yeah. They say watched already and subbed. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, you guys are amazing. They say subbed, good sir. Very nice. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate that. I had three. I had three subscribers yesterday. So. <laughs> <laughs> the grizzlies are there they're carving it up yeah. but mostly i mean i can't wait to look more at your course you've got a course as well which we're also going to talk about right yeah yeah well I, I, to, to be honest I, I kind of put that on hold for the, for the second because i, I well, i'm now going to concentrate on the on the um yes on the YouTube. on the youtube channel i can't i, I don't want to split things i want to do I'm, I'm, I'm all in on something <laughs> or not um, so I'm all in on same the here. Yeah, <laughs> right so. same here you never look back once it's youtube it's like oh dear this is yeah. what you're doing now so this is but what is I'm this going this on. Would I be the Academy. oldest YouTuber ever? Right? You're probably going to be on YouTube forever. And we can't no, wait. I'll so be the oldest one. I can't be No, definitely one. not. I mean, the demographic even here for my audience is uh, something like 83% are over the age of 50. 50 to 65. That's the oh, demographic. Oh, there you go. All right. I'm in good company. Yeah, you're in good company. So <laughs> if you if if they could just check out your website, though, right? You've got murderacademy.com. There's the homepage. So you, you've still got the free course going, right? Yeah, so that will stay there. That will stay there. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I don't, I'll be honest, I've, I've been retired two days. I don't know where it's going to go. <laughs> I'm going to go with the flow. I, I'm going to do what people want. And if, if people want content in a, in, in a particular way, then then, that, then that's where I'll go. Okay, great. Yo, we're very excited. I'll be over there as well. We're all very excited to see your content and to, of course, read your book, Murder Investigation Team, How Scotland Yard Really Catches Killers. So based on that title, what is one of the biggest myths, you know, that how do people think that Scotland Yard catches killers versus what you share in your book, for instance? Yeah, so so I would say two things. Um, if ever you, you you read or you hear about Scotland Yard, the, the, what what conjures up? Now, I was a detective inspector. I don't know how many books I've seen based on a detective inspector. You would not base a book on on what I did because it would be pretty dull. I've got to be honest. Um, <laughs> when when we, when we investigate murder, there, there are so just on the murder team alone, there are about thirty people. Attached to that, you've got so none of us do forensics. So attached to that, you've got all the forensics teams. You've got different specialities that we, that we call in so it's a huge it's a huge um process there's no one person running around doing the the, the there's no hero um you, <laughs> funny enough when people join the murder team um it does take them a little bit of time to get their head around <laughs> the fact that there is no quick they come in and it's like you have a team meeting team meetings are really important in murder investigations and the new people will come in and you can see them. I'm not knocking them for it because I, I probably would have been the same. And they're all looking for the, ah, I'm going to solve it, I'm going to solve it, I'm going to solve it. Murders aren't solved on one thing. There could be one thing that really helps. Um, there could be one thing that turns a case. But you don't solve a murder on on one clue on, on this. It's a, it's, it's a really methodical picture building. You have to, you, you have to, you, you have to, right. So also as well, you have to consider as the best, Best lawyers, defense lawyers, are on murder cases. So everything you do has to be 100%. And if you make a mistake, they'll find it. And if they find it, you'll lose your case. So you have to be really methodical about everything you do. And your, your paperwork has to be in order. And if you, you, you find a gun, you need to know everywhere that gun is from the time it's found to the time it's caught. Someone says, on this day at that time, where was it? You have to have continued uh, uh, continuity of all your exhibits um i might be i might be, might be talking wrong here but i seem to have this memory of um the oj simpson case where um detectives were coming out of a crime scene and they had um bags that were open and they were picked up on the fact that exhibit bags were done when they walked out of it. well that, that can't happen so when in, when an exhibit is found um if we're talking about a gun photographed where it is a sketch plan of where it is um DNA taken from the gun before it's even moved. Um, nothing, nothing happens to that gun, and, to, and and then when it's and then when it's picked up, it goes into a, a box. It gets it gets um, like with wire wire attached into the box. The bags, nothing can touch it. Wherever it moves, everybody knows. If it gets opened, everybody's got the masks and the. So it's 
I saw someone said that devil is in the detail, and it's 100% true. It's, it's all about the detail. And if you get the detail wrong, no matter how good a detective you are, no matter how much work you put in, you'll lose your case. And that's not exciting. <laughs> it's really not exciting. Yeah. And it's not good. It wouldn't make good TV, and it wouldn't make a good book. Uh, but that's how you solve murders. Um, and I'd, I'd love to say it's exciting, and I was, I've, I'm running around, and I'm jumping across the car bonnets. <laughs> it's not. It really isn't. <laughs> Um, I've had some hairy moments, don't get me wrong, um, but that's more to generally when you're arresting people, not not the, the solving the case. The solving the case is done through just methodical police work. Yes. Okay, oh, that makes sense. Dotting I's and crossing T's is exactly it. Yes. Exactly. Yep. That's what they're saying. That's it. Thank you so much, everyone. It's all documentation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in that case, which I know you haven't... Um, deep dive the Gabby Petito case. But just one question that I would have based on your experience on domestic violence mm. ending then in homicide. Isn't it a bit, how often with the bully or the abuser, speculatively, off themselves, as in take their own life, but also then, you know what fascinates all of us about that case is that his parents have no reaction emotionally. Isn't that strange? Because you say you always look at the, the victim's families first and that's like raw. But in this case, yeah. they have no emotion. Isn't that so strange? <laughs> No, but funny enough, um, again, I talk about this in my book. So when you, when you go, you, when you're dealing with these families, I've, I've described raw emotion, but the reaction from that differs so much. So um, I talk about the five stages of grief. And mm -hmm. um, the one that always threw me, always threw me was acceptance. And I, I sometimes <laughs> I was like, I've just told you that your son's died and you you almost you, you find yourself saying, "Did you understand me?" Um, yes. So, what I what I would say, I don't know about the case, but yeah. what I'd say is you can't you can't take a person's apparent indifference mm -hmm. as being something that you can judge because, like I say, if I've just told someone their son's died and they're like, "All oh, right, do you want a cup of tea?" Oh, not it's not that like that, but it almost <laughs> is. Um, that doesn't mean that a person. That they're, they're processing it inside in a different way and mm -hmm. they're not expressing it to me. Um, so I'll just be very careful. I don't know the case and I, I don't know no, these people. That I'll makes just, sense. I'll be very careful about jumping to conclusions because of how someone is perceived because we all deal with things differently. Yeah, that makes sense. Welcome to Lieutenant Peter Pranzo in the house. Hello. It's like Ted Bundy's mom uh, when she heard all the tapes of, you know, all these confessions and she said, right, who's for apple pie and ice cream? <laughs> Right. It was like, no, they were yeah, like, because, what? Because internally, all sorts could be going on. And the way she's expressing it is weird to us. Um, but you don't know yeah. what's going on in the inside. And, and like I say, I don't know the case, but I just think you can't, you can't judge people on how they react to things um, because everybody yeah. reacts differently. And I know, and I, and I know because it's the other way around and it's the, the, the suspect's parents, but it's the same principle. They, they, they've, they've lost their son. Um, yes. And how do you process that? And 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 in and, and in their eyes, can they grieve their son? Can they have? Mm. Can they can can they go to um, a a funeral and express the same grief that other parents would, knowing mm. what their son's done? And it's they're they're processing all this. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I'm sticking up. No, it makes sense because they don't want um, a funeral or anything like that. They're yeah, saying no funeral, no saying, nothing. So yeah, yeah, you you just, you just have to be very careful about judging people on how and how they uh, react exactly. to things. As, as Manta says, yes. everybody reacts differently. Exactly. All right. So welcome to Rochelle Pranzo as well in the house. Uh, also a retired, uh, retired detectives, NYPD, Lieutenant Peter Pranzo. <laughs> Hello, Peter. So let me see if there's a question that I missed here for you. Um, so I say Laura Richards is a criminal behavioral analyst and international expert on stalking, domestic violence, homicide, and risk assessment. She worked with Scotland Yard for 10 years. Did you ever get to work with her? And how has her work impacted Scotland Yard? I, no, I don't I don't know this this person. Okay. So, um, <laughs> okay. Well, I would say so so what what does she do again? She was criminology. Right. So Yeah, she's a criminal behavioral analyst. I know she's worked for yeah. Scotland Yard and also works with the FBI as well. Um and she definitely works on like the laws, you yeah. know, the fight for justice in domestic violence cases and stalking honest? and things like that. Can I be honest? Uh, yes, I, yes. She's not listening, is she? She's not listening right now. She's not here right now. <laughs> <laughs> My experience of criminal behaviorists is quite disappointing if I'm honest um 
Now, maybe it's just the cases I was on. Um, I never felt they really added much. Um, it was interesting. Um, and they talk about uh, certain characteristics of people. But it never really solved any of our cases. So, I'm a, But I'm not poo-pooing it. It might nope. just be uh, <laughs> on our cases. Or we have bad behaviorists, I don't know. But, um, yeah, my experience of it isn't. I, I know it sounds sexy and it sounds like it would be useful. And I can, and, and, and one of the things you will, all, what you will, whenever you speak to me, um, I will only, I will be completely honest with you, but I won't, I won't um, talk about something I don't know because I can't yeah. position myself as an expert and then be guessing stuff. Exactly. Um, so I'm never, never going to guess anything. Um, so I can only talk from my point of view. And when it comes to that, I've not had a good experience. It makes sense. I see. Wow. Time flies when we're having fun. But do you have a little bit more time or do you have to have strictly an I'm, hour? I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mods, right. if we could go for like 20 more minutes or so, I'll we go over yeah. time every time. It's what we do over here. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Could I just very, very, I know this is rude. Yes. Just two no, seconds. no. Just, I'm in my kitchen. Could I just get some water? Yes. Go ahead. No, okay. I'll, I'll put seconds. myself on solo yeah. view. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you so much also for all your questions. Uh, thank you for subscribing to Murder Academy. I can't wait to read the book. Oh, my goodness. This is like I'm fan, fangirling over the book. It's so awesome, the book that has uh, been written here. So we will all go check it out, I'm sure, afterwards. You are back with your water. Got to stay hydrated. <laughs> Okay, so let's see. Uh, when you described all the different uh, motives, right, that drive people to kill, what do you believe Dr. Harold Shipman's motive was? Because that, that's a serial killer, right? Pull of emotion. Like, pull of emotion. So oh. whatever, whatever happened once, twice, he felt he needed to do it again. He needed to do it again. Um, the con it's probably control and power. It was power. He had power over someone's life. Whether you died, live or di whether you lived or died, I had power over that. Yes. That, that's I genuinely I mean I, I've got to be honest I don't have a lot of I don't have any experience of serial killers because in in the UK we don't get that many um, yeah. <laughs> my experience is single killers they might have killed more than one people but not in the serial killing way um, but I, I, I know killers I know how people work and it's yeah I've done it once I enjoyed it I yes. did it again, I did it again I did it again that, that's that's what I do Dr. Harold Shipman, the Yorkshire Ripper. Yeah. <laughs> Jack that, the they're Ripper. All the same. They're all the same. They've done it once. And yep. whatever rush, whatever feeling they got from it, they needed to do it again. That's that's what they were doing. Goodness. Goodness. So if you guys have, uh, they say great guests, they're all just saying, love this great guest. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm so okay. glad. <laughs> okay. So let me see what other questions I have. <laughs> yeah, I've got them all like written down. <laughs> yeah, so refer to that. I wish I could just remember them all. Okay. Let's see. You've launched Murder Academy, which you told us about. Um, so in your mind, what are some of the, the worst, uh, murderers in London, either during your career or in history? Um, well, in my career, I, I'll always come back to the same thing. It's children. Um, I can't, yeah, okay. I, can, I can never get my head around how someone could kill a child. Um, now I'm not, I'm not saying that killing an adult was any less or, but I, I, how can he, how can he kill a child? So to me, that would always be my answer. Um, okay, the worst, okay. the worst people I've ever come across that I, I look at and I, 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 I can't. I can't even begin to imagine it is is killing children. Okay, they say is coercive control a pull of emotion? Yes, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a different okay. question: Have you ever met the Queen? <laughs> I, I, I don't think I've ever, I think you might be the most important person I've ever met, Gisela. I've, I've never really <laughs> met that many important people. Got to be honest. Oh my, oh my goodness! No, you're very important. <laughs> you'll see. Oh my word! We can't wait to learn everything about what you know. I hope you'll be back on the show as well. It's so nice. No, to I'll be here. back whenever you want, honestly, because this is this is really it's important for me because um, I had three subscribers yesterday. How pathetic is that? <laughs> all right, do you know what I mean? No, there's no point in knowing all this stuff and wanting to share it if I've got no one to share it with. So. Um, yeah, look, if, if we we can have a relationship, I'll be very, very happy. Right. As Police of the Cuff says, cross-pollination. <laughs> we like that over here. <laughs> cross-pollination of the Grizzlies. Yeah. Uh, they say most difficult case, obviously, that I'm assuming now it would be children still, but most difficult case. Yeah, so so there's this, there was this one particular one. Um, again, I write about this in my book. And, and the reason it's difficult is because it's one of those ones that I can see. Um, oh, yeah. So... I didn't go to the scene. I, I I went straight to the to the autopsy, and I was asked whether I wanted. So in 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 London, we've got. I don't think I've discussed this, have we? So we've in 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 London, we've got twenty murder teams. Um, we used to have twenty nine, 
and budget cuts, the government cut back, cut back, cut back. And one of the teams was a specialised um, child child death team. So when I joined the murder team, we didn't deal with child deaths, and we knew, we knew that. Um, and it was kind of comforting knowing that I wouldn't have to deal with that. And they got disbanded. And very, very, very soon, I think it might have been the first, I think it might have been the first case that they wouldn't have dealt with came, came to our, our team. And my boss at the time called me into the office. And, and as I walked in, I just knew what he was going to say because I'd, I'd worked with him for years. And I knew, I knew this, there was this job that was, this particular role was looming and it was to do with the autopsy. And he sat me down and I said, I know what you're going to ask me. Yes, I'll do it. Um, and then I had to go and find, so I was, I was the detective sergeant at the time. So I needed a detective constable to go with me. And it's like, oh, who am I going to choose? And I, I chose this girl. And, and again, same thing. Yeah, I'll do it. And we do. You do you, you're not going to not do it. And we went there. We went to, in, in London, they got, it's called uh, Great Ormond Street. It's a hospital for, for children. Hmm. And I, I, can, I, I can literally picture it now. I can picture it now. It took us ages, actually, to find the, the mortuary. They always stick them right at the bottom of the, the, of the hospital so you can't find them. And I, and I walked in, and um, this little boy, Daniel, uh, three, laying there on uh, the, one of those metal beds, tables. Um, mm. I can picture him now. And it was it was hard, really, really hard. And obviously, special post-mortems or autopsies, they go really deep. And I'm not, I don't want to get into it now, but um, seeing this boy basically taken apart in front of me was, was really, really hard. And do you know what happened to him? So he he's, his mum asked his aunt to look after him for the night. She, she, she had to go go somewhere and uh, he's, he was, uh, it was her sister and she was a nurse and she went to work that night and left him with her husband um, and so the next morning she got back and what, so, so essentially what happens is she phoned an ambulance for an ambulance and said I've just got home my nephew has been breathing funny um, and then he's, 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 he's become unconscious. So that, so the ambulance people turn up and, um, they're not happy because he's cold. And if he, if he just died, he, he, he wouldn't be cold. Mm -hmm. so, so we got called. So it was all a bit, it was, it was quite suspicious, but at that point it wasn't quite clear what had happened. So we went to the post-mortem and what we, what my job would be is to brief the pathologist, um, you don't call them pathologists, do you, in, in the United States? Is it might be coroner or... Um, ah, coroner, but, probably. <laughs> yeah. So, so I explained to him um, the, the circumstances. Mum got home. So the aunt got home. He's in bed, blah, blah, blah. Look, looking at Daniel, you wouldn't have appreciated the injuries he had. But as soon as, as, soon as he was opened up, the, the pathologist stopped. He said, this, is, this, this isn't right. He said... The injuries this boy has got is either been hit by a car or he's been thrown out of a window. Mm. And I was like, I, I said, look, I can only tell you what I've been told. So I went back on the phone. <clears throat> is there any chance he's been thrown out of a window? And they're like looking around the flat. looking, No, just, um, but no. So it's, essentially what had happened is Daniel had wet the bed and his uncle got so angry at him wetting the bed that he inflicted injuries on him the, the pathologist, who was one of the most experienced pathologists in the country, said it was the worst injuries he'd ever seen because he'd wet the bed. Um, he'd been broken bones, chest, ribs. I mean, just horrific wow. injuries because he'd wet the bed. Um, hmm. It's really hard. I mean, just talking about it, now, I do feel a little bit emotional because yes. just seeing Daniel, I can still see him now. Um, Shame, yeah, yeah. It's really hard. And he wet the bed. I mean, who does that? Push of emotion. <laughs> The trigger was oh, in the bed. He got angry, um, and then wow. inflicted those injuries on Daniel. Goodness, that is terrible. I'm sorry that you had to see that as well. And you know, it is hard to go through yeah. years and years of seeing cases like that and ones like that that stick with you. So one of and my then, question was, yes. And another <laughs> another thing about this job, right? So so we we'd gone there, um, and this the, just before. So we were, we were we were waiting because uh, I think we got there a little bit early. My colleague and I was we was we've stood those beds, those metal beds that you see people getting pushed into into the um, mortuary in. We're, we're sat there and we're I'm kind of leaning on this bed, and my colleague looks down. I turn around, and there's this little girl laying on there, 
um she I, I, I can't remember she must be five six or seven like that yeah. just made up like a like a like a doll um like really really pretty little girl in a little dress and it, com it completely I wasn't because wow. we weren't expecting it, and there's something about that. I mean, that that job, I don't think because I it almost like I went from one to the other. I just just yes. saw this little girl, and what's what's really struck me was because it because it was a hospital, it was a children's hospital. My immediate thought was she's been made up for the parents that are upstairs, and they've got this little little girl, and it, and it threw the it really threw both of us, and we were like. And, and then we went and saw it, and I was like, that was one of those days you're like, I'll just, I just, I uh, probably went and had a drink or something after that. Goodness, all... yeah. So that that was my question. So I say, when you're working on a homicide case, there must be a lot of terrible lows and incredible highs. And of course, this community and myself, we are not detectives in general. There might be, a, there are some detectives in the house, huh? Lieutenant Peter Pronzo. <laughs> but generally, we are like, armchair detectives right yeah. and i think somewhat we experience a little just a little taste of that those those highs and those lows as we immerse ourselves in just looking at a case with all the media that we have of course it's not quite the same <laughs> as what you did but in this regard do you have any like habits or routines that helped you to deal with the grim nature of these that crimes and working with them yeah i, I compartmentalize so ah. i just shut things away um, I write about this in my book, actually, with one of the things, one of, one of the, um, I think probably the most, the second most common question I got from my survey on the Facebook group was, how do you cope with what you see? So I put a lot yes. of thought into it. If I'm going to write about it, I'm going to put a lot of thought into it. And it wasn't any more complicated than I just locked it away. Um, you, you, you sort of, you, when you come away, you can't dwell on it. You can't, as, as, as much, I, as I say that, obviously, I've got some that I can't get out, but of the hundreds and hundreds of bodies I've seen, to only be able to remember one or two is actually, mm. that, that's how it works. You kind of just shut it away um, because you have to. And, and and another way, right, so and again, I write about this, and I have to be careful how I, how I express this, but within, within um, our world, there's a, quite a dark humour. Mm. And it's not disrespectful. It's not... Um, belittling what you're doing it's, it's, it's nothing to but in order to get through the camaraderie and the jokes and the and and and, and you're just there for each other that really that really does help so we so for instance um i was on the anti-terrorist branch and um in july 2005 we were on call um i remember we sat around in a canteen and we were watching we had, we had a big television screen and um we had, uh, we've got a channel called Sky News, and, and it came up. There was a power surge on a on a um, on an underground train, and we were like be interested in it. And then the next the next thing we know is that we get a phone call saying a bomb has gone off. Then we get another one. Another bomb has come off. Another bomb has gone off. Another bomb has gone off. And we're like, so um, my colleague and I we got to uh, a place called Edgware Road, the first uh, train station, the tube station, and we were the first from the Antwerp Terrace branch there. And we didn't leave for two weeks and we spent two weeks. So the first, the, one, our first task was to take the, take the bodies away. Um, I think we had seven there. We, we, we took the, the bodies. I had the privilege, if you call it that, of putting the um, suicide bombers remains into a bag and bagging them up and taking them away. Wow. <laughs> and then we spent the next two weeks basically on our hands and knees um, collecting it. So, in, in in the underground at London, in London, there's like these grey. My hands are here, so about this sort of size, grey stones, and they cover the whole of the track. <clears throat> and it was our job to go from um, just short of where the bomb went off to just past where the train stopped, and collect everything from from the um, track. Um, and being a suicide bomber, you can imagine what was on the track. Um, so. Oh. Yeah, so we, so and it was in the height of summer. It was really, it was, it, it got really bad. It got, it got really bad with, with what was down there. Um, but we got through it. But a lot of it was just by just being there for each other. There were about ten of us down there, um, and I would hate ever to anyone have ever gone down and glimpsed what we were doing because mm -hmm. they would, well, well, what, why are you joking about that? Um, what, what is to laugh at? But you have to, you have to deal with it that way. And the, and 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 the time, the, the hardest time we had, they they asked us to stop. And families of the um, of the victims came down to the tube station and stood outside. Like this little, I think, if a memory serves me right, 
it might have been a Sunday or something, and there was a there was a vicar there and, and doing something, a priest. And I think that was the hardest because it was it become more personal because it wasn't bits of body, it was someone's loved one. I mean, yes. Uh, um, but again, so you deal with that. And and one of the things that that, that I, again I write about that in my book is um, at the end of that we were put in a room together and said we're all blokes quite a macho unit does anybody need counseling <laughs> what? yeah what's going to happen no, i don't need counseling i'm the I'm I'm <laughs> geezer i don't need counseling so so we didn't have counseling and it's no surprise that i'm aware of at least two or three officers that ended up with issues um uh-huh. from that um is and and i'm not I'm, i don't i don't blame them yeah. at all it's hard um but but that was what 2005 um yeah very very poor support um one of the last cases i was involved in was i can't talk much about it because it's still ongoing um it was a police officer shot in a in a police station he was um uh, the custody sergeant that books in prisoners and someone got arrested um taken into the police station and they had a gun on him and shot the police officer there and then um Mm. and uh so I'm going to say something now. I have to be careful about what I say, um, but I but I saw the CCTV for that. We were investigating it probably um, 20, 30 times. And this officer's last words. I'm not. I can't say them because the case isn't in the court. But it's something quite specific that I quite often say to my children. And whenever I say it, I hear, I see that video, and mm-hmm. and. It's it's weird, but we've been offered counselling since. I didn't take it up. Maybe I should have listened to myself now. Um, but my point being, now this was like the, this was last year, and the, the counselling was so much better. So, I mean, they they didn't ask us once; they asked us again. They asked us again. They asked us again. Wow. Um, so yeah, so I think the police are slowly catching up to the fact that people can be affected by what they see and what they do. Absolutely. So they're all saying PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Yeah. Could so be a thing. again, I write about this in my book. Is um, I compartmentalize. I don't deal with things. Um, my dad died recently, um, and I wrote down my eulogy. And I've got to say, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and I cried. I cried an awful lot. And my sisters were there. They were trying to help me get through it. It was really, really hard because what I was doing. I was expressing myself. I was talking about feelings. I was talking about how I felt about my dad, and I don't do that. I just yes. lock everything away. And so, again, I keep saying about my book, but I talk about how I used to think that the bravest people are, are like me. I deal with things. I, I can get on with it. I can do it. But to me, I've, I've come to realize the bravest people are the ones that can talk about it, the ones that don't just lock it away and, and just pretend yes. it didn't happen. Um, because it's much harder to deal with something than it is to lock it away. And the problem is, is what I worry about is where there I was about my dad being able to express it and I, I couldn't and I, and I ended up in a blubbering, blubbering wreck. Is that going to catch up on me one day? And I hope it doesn't. I don't think it will. But it's always lurking there. Is is there something that I've locked away that is it? Oh, and another thing, <laughs> I'm waffling. If I've talked too much. Oh, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> they love the waffle. They love the waffle on this channel. <laughs> right. So for a few years now, I, I've, i and this is something I've, only, I've put in my book, so I might as well talk about it now. It's, it's something I only ever talked about with my partner, is I've had r- really violent dreams. Oh, yeah. Like where I'm inflicting, I'm shooting people, I'm stabbing people. Like strength, <laughs> we've done right. some in my dreams, honestly. And I used to, and I used to laugh about it because I'm not a violent person, um, and I, I don't really have anger issues or anything like that. But every night I would go to go to bed, and I'd have the most violent dreams. And funnily enough, since I've stopped investigating murders, the dreams have stopped. And now, wow, that's not a con- that's not a coincidence, is it? So again. Is that is was that some sort of coping mechanism that I was seeing all this stuff during the day? I was processing it in my brain at night. Um, Probably. But now I have nice fluffy dreams. It's much nicer. I can dream. That's about much that. nicer, right? That was my experience too when I wrote the I wrote four serial killer books, and that is also why I kind of stopped that because of the dreams that then happen. Ooh. And sometimes because you step into their mind for so long, in your dreams you become like them, and you do what they did because you're really living it because you lived it all day. It's actually terrible. I'm glad I'm not alone. So, uh, oh, yeah. No, you're not alone there. You wake up like, yeah. what was that? <laughs> it's it's right. horrible, isn't it? 
Yeah, so I've got your book on screen here, Murder Investigation Team. So where can people get your book? I know it's just launched recently as well, right? Yeah, the weekend. Um, so it's on Amazon. Um, it's on, so I've just, so it should be, uh, it's available in all, on e, in ebook form, ebook form. So you can go to all, all your normal ebook places like um, uh, Apple or wherever you go. But I mean, most people go to Amazon, don't they? But it's on Amazon anyway. Typing it into Amazon. Here it is, everyone. Murder investigation team. How Scotland Yard really catches killers, right? So you can just type in Stephen's name over there. Keo. That's how you say it. Keo, yep. <laughs> Kindle, hardcover, and paperback. Wow, you've even got hardcover. That is so awesome. There's a whole description there. I mean, Kindle, you get it right now at $6.95. That is a steal. That is like a cup of coffee. Go get it. I would personally, yeah, hardcover. Mm, that would be the choice. That's $20. Still a steal. That's amazing. So I hope everyone goes to buy your book. And of course, everyone, if you go buy the book, the most important thing is once you've read it, please leave a review. It's very important for newly published books to have reviews, especially on Amazon. It makes like all yeah. the difference. It's, I, I self-published as well. So I've got no one behind me. So um yeah so right. reviews are really quite important same same at least we can have that in common <laughs> sharing the self-publishing journey right. is quite well, a thing you know pain. <laughs> <laughs> right i know the pain so reviews really matter that you yeah. know so if you could go right. and click some stars there i think amazon's got like a new rule where you have to spend 50 dollars within a year to be able to review but if any of you in the audience want to be so nice i know many of you have gone to subscribe now thank you so much as well to murder academy but if you want to buy the book and click some stars that would be amazing that would mean a lot to me thank you that would be great. And they're all sharing the links off to Amazon after this. I like paperbacks. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, everyone. I've got the link there as well. And I put Murder Academy there as well. So let, let's go and get that. And let's just see where we're at now, just for interest sake, just to see what kind of grizzlies went over there. Because I know there's 176. Okay, there's 289 of you here. I know that we can have we can get it to 200 tonight. So if you would be so kind. We'll wait. We'll wait for you over here. <laughs> Go there quickly. Quickly subscribe and then come back and let us know you did that. That would be amazing. Let's let's get uh, Stephen's channel to two hundred because, of course, you want to see more of this information, right? I know I do. Right? How do we find Stephen on YouTube? So I will just share it here as well. This is what it's called: Murder Academy. I think you could literally type in Murder Academy. So let me show you how I also did it on day one. Murder Academy. Go to filters and type in channel. That's the quick way. And then it's right on top. There we go. All right. But there's also links. There's links that the mods are sharing. So either click uh, the link or go and do what I just did. That would be great. And also as well, please post your questions. If anything you want to know, um, I'll do my best to put to put videos up that people want to. Because otherwise I'm just yes. talking about what I want to talk about. Where I, I'd much right. better rather talk about what people want to know. Yes, and I, um, for all Thank of you, you any questions that I couldn't get to tonight that you asked, so please go and ask them over there because it also boosts engagement if you do comment on the video and ask all the questions you had there. There was one saying, did you struggle to at any point to separate your personal life and your, your work life during that career? Uh, well, I'm divorced. <laughs> so, okay, so the answer um, is... <laughs> yeah, so I, I think there's a, there's a, there's a saying amongst... Um, uh, detectives that you're not a proper detective unless you've got a divorce behind you and i think there's a lot to do with that um <laughs> i, I can yeah like I've, I've got uh two children like so for instance when i was on the anti-terrorist branch i remember doing this um we were doing a surveillance operation on on some terrorists and i i for 50 50 nights but i i was working from um 4 p.m till 7 a.m and i didn't see my, my kids for 50 oh. 50 days um and that's, that's hard. It really, it, yeah. So, <laughs> I'm quite pleased I'm out of that for, for one thing. Yeah, definitely. Right. That is so okay. I'm just typing in. They say name of channel, Murder Academy. Type it in. Look for the filter. Filter for channels. They say, I'll be right over. We're waiting to get to 200. Then we'll, yeah, right. 197. Three more to go. Let's go, guys. <laughs> they say her loss. <laughs> so sweet. Like, <laughs> I like it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. And just subscribe. I really appreciate it. So here's name of channel, Murder Academy. Type it into YouTube search bar, search for filter channel if you can't find it, or just click the links right here. Thank you so much. And they say thank you to you for sharing with us, Mr. Keo. You're welcome. Right. Oh, they say I'm a workaholic too. I know. <laughs> Should have been a detective, right? <laughs> but no, I'm not divorced. So glad I'm not a detective. Yeah. <laughs> right? That yeah. was well married. Stay married, yeah. 
right? My husband's a workaholic. You just got to marry a workaholic too, right? <laughs> just marry those. You never see each other. It's all good. <laughs> Stay married forever. Um, with a pilot, I was a pilot, I told you before, and man, the divorce rate there was very high. Like everyone on average there gets married three times. Wow. So I would assume that's the, the push, like the push pull that. emotion, right? <laughs> they do it again and again. And I'm like, don't you learn the first time though? <laughs> Three times, yeah, in the Mile High Club, exactly. Um, so thank you, everyone, for watching. I think for now we've gone over time, right? 20 minutes, uh, Gizlet, type A, yes, <laughs> right? Um, thank you so much, Lieutenant Peter Pranzo. I always laugh when you say that. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. We're going to end it for now because uh, Stephen will be back on the show. You know, this is some great uh, insight, some great cross-pollination. Cross but hold on, before I say end it, there we go, 205. We got there. Thank yeah. you so much, Grizzlies. You did it. You did it. We need to get Steven's channel to 1000 so he can do polls and ask wow. you guys, what do you want to hear this week? <laughs> huh? What do you want to say? You know, and then if he, if he does the polls on the community, like I do on my community tab, you can vote for what you want to hear from him next. But in the meantime, please check out the book. Uh, all the links are in the description box below. So you've subscribed. Check out the book. Check out murderacademy.com. That will be amazing as well. And yeah, thank you so much for being here. It was so nice to have you here. I, I enjoyed it. I, I mean, it's one of those subjects I could talk about for for, for hours and hours. So yeah, right. It. And same here. So you could you could be here weekly if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got your own YouTube stuff to do. I know. But we will see Stephen back here at uh, some stage very yeah, soon. Okay, 100%. everyone. Yeah. So we're going to say goodbye for now and hang out in the after party room in StreamYard. <laughs> Don't be jealous. It's all good. Um, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much. Anything you cool. want to say to them? On your no, just, just thank, thank you for tuning in um yeah and, and everybody that subscribes to my channel it really means a lot i mean literally two days into this so having 200 people is, is brilliant thank you yes and go ask your questions there in the comment section don't yeah. forget because that is the way one you'll get them answered all the questions you had that i didn't get to here today and two it will boost the engagement into the yeah. algorithm you know what i'm saying and i promise to respond whoever whoever messages me i promise to respond very nice very nice keep him busy <laughs> give me you're gonna regret saying that one day i was like i said that in the beginning and i'm like i don't know i can't do it right now. <laughs> eventually it's like mm -mm, i'm very sorry <laughs> but anyway for now guys go and ask your questions now now it's golden time you can have all your questions answered there right now so i'm going to play my little outro and i'll see you guys in the next video thank you so much for being here cool take care all right let's play this one <laughs>